Our next speaker is um, going to be uh, Dr. Joyce Liao. Um, Dr. Liao is the Director of Neuro-Ophthalmology here at Stanford. Um, and what neuro-ophthalmology is, is the kind of the caring of diseases and disorders of the eye related to the brain. So a neuro-ophthalmologist is a very specialized ophthalmologist, and I think I've known Joyce for about 20 years now. Um, through She's dual trained in neurology and ophthalmology. Um, and uh, she, she really you know, cares a lot about the, the patients. A lot of patients with brain tumors that have eye disorders uh, get sent to her, and she's done an amazing job with, with the patients that I've, that I've got her involved with. So she's gonna speak today about um, eye problems related to kind of, you know, tumor surgery. And just one side note, um, they, I was told the AC is off in this building right now, so that's why some of the doors are open. Okay, Dr. Liao. Hi there, everyone. You guys doing all right? I don't know about you, but I feel pretty zen right now after the last talk, right? Um, so I'm so glad you're here. Uh, you're going to learn everything you need to know about eyes as it is relevant to you. So um, let's jump right into it. Eye problems associated with acoustic neuroma often presents with very vague symptoms. So most of the time, you may not say, my God, I've you know, lost my vision completely. Most of the time, it's more vague, like, my vision seems kind of blurry. It comes and goes. Maybe it's only blurry when I'm reading or when I'm driving, or there are things that I used to be able to do, but I can't do now. So you shouldn't be uh, worried that there is nothing going on. You should be looking for an eye doctor to get things checked out, just to make sure that things are okay. So let me give you a little um, summary uh, overview of um, eye brain um, issues. So this is how we look at the world. Uh, this is a picture of Stanford main campus, Memorial Church, right at the Oval. And when you look at a beautiful picture like this, you're fixating on it with your eyes, which means you're fixating on it with your brain. So let me map out exactly how you look at the world this way. Uh, I'm gonna superimpose um, a visual field map. This is a very standard test that we do in the eye clinic. The center of the cross is the center of your vision. So you put the center of your vision right on whatever it is that interests you. So in this case, you know, the Memorial Church. And we all have a blind spot that we conveniently ignore. So it's there. There's one in each eye. That's where the optic nerve comes out of the eyeball. So we all have one. So when you look at something, you basically superimpose this map over and over again on your visual surrounding. So you move your eyes, the center of your vision moves. You move again. So this is how you take in the world. In fact, this is how you're looking at me and my slides right now. So essentially, you move your eyes over and over again to, until you're satisfied with what you're looking at. So this is a scan path of one of my favorite uh, paintings. So when I'm looking at a beautiful piece of artwork like this, uh, I put the circles, which is where I'm looking at, the fixations, right on the area of interest. A lot of people start with the center of whatever it is they're looking at. So that's the beautiful princess right there. And then they look around, and then eventually they kind of find their way to the dog on the left lower corner. Uh, when you scan, look at the world this way, you generate a heat map of your attention. And so uh, you do this over and over again all day. You do it when you're reading. Reading is a very particular pattern of looking at the world. For English, you're reading left to right, top to bottom. The circles are landing on bigger words, the words that you care about. The lines are basically the eye movements are connecting them. Uh, you also do this when you're watching a movie, India, golf, nine or nine are and it's kind of loud, so each of the circle is basically where uh, this person is looking at, and you basically jump around looking at the world this way. So, sorry, we can't keep watching the movie. <laughs> so what you do is you put the world on the most sensitive part of your eyes, 
on the retina. And this process is called foveation. So you look over and over again. So let's say you want to look at that ladybug. You put that ladybug right on the most sensitive part of your eye in the retina. The information is captured, kind of like a camera, by the retina. The information is then sent to the brain through the optic nerve, and the brain says, OK, I see a ladybug. It has red wings, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and is moving uh, at a certain direction. So when we look at the world this way, uh, it requires that we control not just what we see, but how we move our eyes. And so for these controls, the acoustic neuroma is actually impacted because this is how we move our eyes. So uh, in order to move the eyes, your brain sends a signal that says, move and the neurons fire, then uh, you want to hold that position because you just landed at whatever it is you want to look at. And in order to hold that position, your multiple sensory pathways actually help you to be able to do that. So there's the vision, of course, and you notice on the left lower corner the vestibular system. It helps you hold your eyes there. So uh, this is why it's important for patients with acoustic neuroma to realize that there could be vision issues, this could be kind of vague, and it's important to seek out medical attention whenever there is a subtle uh, symptom, just to make sure things are okay. So just to re uh, review the symptoms a little bit, this could be blurry vision, this could be lo uh, loss of vision, or it could be double vision. So let's go over a few cases uh, just to illustrate what it may involve. So here's a 28-year-old man with a, a right acoustic neuroma, and he has a very good uh, doctor, Dr. Jackler, who then sends him to me and says, please take a look, because sometimes uh, there could be something even when uh, the patient is doing well. So he's had hearing loss since elementary school, uh, right side more than left side, and he has some findings uh, associated with the acoustic neuroma. And basically, you know, a simple evaluation for vision, he has zero symptoms. He's actually doing very well from a vision standpoint. So this is uh, what his MRI looks like. He has a very small acoustic neuroma where the uh, arrow is pointing. Um, and so when we look at his eyes, uh, on the left is a picture of just sort of a regular picture. And then we have some nice cameras with bright lights. And so we take a picture of it. And in the green box uh, is where I'm going to magnify to show you. So in that green area, when it's magnified, we find a little tiny nodule. Uh, this is called a Lisch nodule. And uh, this is sometimes found in associated with uh, acoustic neuroma. And this is harmless. It's just a, a little pigmented, sometimes uh, just you know, overgrowth. There could be many of them uh, in uh, acoustic neuroma. There could literally be one, like what I just showed you. It could possibly just be in one eye. So uh, these uh, findings indicate certain things. Uh, and so because the eye exam is very sensitive, you're able to pick up things like that. Other things that could be found would be a cataract. And you might think this 28-year-old is a little too young for cataract, but it turns out with uh, some conditions associated with acoustic neuroma, you could have cataracts at a very young age. And so these are the things that may give you a blurry vision that you don't realize until you see an eye doctor. So uh, for this um, man, uh, the, back, the front of the eye, uh, we found the Lisch nodule. He did not have a cataract and the back of the eye uh, looked great. So these are pictures of his optic nerves. Uh, basically, the, the circles with the two arrows pointing to, that's literally his fiber optic cable. So there are um, about 1.2 million neurons in the eye, each forming a single process. That becomes a bundle and it comes out of the eyeball and goes to the brain. So basically, his information highway looks terrific. So it was a very good evaluation. We decided that he would come back annually for a follow-up. Uh, so let me uh, show you another case. Uh, this is a 63-year-old woman who has blurry vision. And she says, you know, my right eye has been kind of different in the last month. 
Sometimes it feels like there's a bug there or there's like a hair, something is blocking my vision. If I were to lie down, the vision changes. Sometimes I see a little double and the left eye vision seems okay and her color vision seems okay. And there are really uh, some other symptoms, but they don't seem to coincide with the vision issues. So we measure her vision. She actually has pretty good vision. 20-30 vision means she could see some pretty small prints, uh, which is great. But when we test her visual feel, remember that map that I showed you in the beginning? Uh, we found that that map actually was not perfect. So the areas in the left eye and the right eye, there are some patchy, darker areas. And this is why she felt like there's something kind of blocking her vision. And so uh, what she has are uh, an enlarged blind spot. So blind spot corresponds to your optic nerve coming out of the eyeball. Somehow that's a little bit larger. And then there are patchy areas, uh, as I described uh, earlier. So uh, what's going on with her? Uh, let me show you her optic nerve. So uh, let me just remind you, this is a picture on the upper right of a normal optic nerve. It looks kind of like a ring. Uh, with a, a clear center, and there are blood vessels coming in and out of it. Uh, so these are her optic nerves. So um, the way the eye doctors look at your eyes is backwards. We look at you like we, we you know, see through your eyes, essentially. So the right eye is on the left, uh, and I label them, so hopefully it's not too confusing. So both of her optic nerves, especially the right one, remember the one that she was complaining about, they're both swollen. So when the nerves are swollen, uh, it's usually not good because that means the information, that information highway isn't clear. Information isn't being sent. Uh, and uh, let me just point out a few features. So in the right uh, optic nerve, the nerve is diffusely swollen, and there are little areas of hemorrhages, uh, and the blood vessels are kind of narrow, which means it's not getting the blood, meaning there, there's a risk to the nerve uh, and loss of oxygen, and the veins look kind of congested. So these are all very typical findings of increased brain pressure as a result of uh, acoustic neuroma. And so this is her MRI. You can see that her acoustic neuroma is relatively larger than the first case. Uh, and there's some pressure effect on the rest of the brain, uh, which is why the uh, pressure has increased uh, and the spaces where the fluid travel in the brain called the ventricles are slightly larger. So uh, in the setting of increased brain pressure from pressure from the acoustic neuroma, there are different symptoms. Not everybody has all the symptoms, but headache is really common. It's a really common symptom as well, so it's difficult to know just just from you know, headache as a symptom by itself, that if you should be worried that there is something more. Uh, blurry vision uh, is a very common symptom. Sometimes people have other symptoms like tinnitus. So whenever you have a constellation of symptoms and you're not sure what's going on, maybe a little subtle change in the vision, it would be great to get it checked out. Here are just pictures of some other uh, examples of swollen optic nerve. Uh, the upper left is relatively mild swelling uh, to the right, which is relatively more severe swelling. So these are all things that would be relatively easy to see uh, on a routine exam. So the last case, I just want to illustrate um, something that actually uh, is quite important in association with uh, acoustic neuroma. Uh, and um, you'll hear more about it this afternoon. Uh, here's an interview that you could find on YouTube um, uh, by, uh, of actor uh, Mark Ruffalo, who developed uh, facial weakness as a result of a, 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 a condition that uh, I won't go into. But essentially, uh, this nearly ended his movie career, which, as we all know, has just you know, blossomed incredibly. And so he didn't let that you know, hold him back. And you'll hear more about how this you know, can be treated this afternoon. Uh, I want to show you a more dramatic example of facial weakness that could occur in the setting of acoustic neuroma, just so you have an you know, idea of what that might look like. Uh, so this is a woman, uh, and what you notice is that she's talking, but, and, and she has a right facial droop, 
but uh, the key I want you to focus here is the fact that her right eye just isn't blinking at all. And so when you have a facial weakness in the setting of acoustic neuroma, basically the blink uh, is also affected. And when the eye is not closing, it gets dry. And so this is one of the most uh, common and most important risk factors for severe dry eye in the setting of acoustic neuroma. So the eye might look red. Uh, it might even look worse than this, but I didn't feel like it was right to show a, you know, gross uh, picture uh, of the eye. But essentially, um, let me just summarize in terms of the typical uh, evaluation uh, when you come to the eye clinic. So we'll measure your visual acuity, you know, how well can you see these tiny letters? That gives us an idea how well uh, you can see out in the real world. We check your pupil. This is when the doctor shines a really annoying bright light in your eyes. That's actually for a good reason. Uh, we then check the front of the eye. We call it the anterior segment. So this is when we check, you know, is there dry eye? Is there irritation of the eyelid? Is there presence of the Lish nodule, the picture that I showed before? Is there a cataract there? Uh, then we look at the back of the eye. We call it the posterior segment. We look at the optic nerve, the retina. And we, we sometimes find really good looking optic nerves like the first case, but sometimes we don't. And you know there could be a surprise. So essentially, we then do some visual field studies and we look at um, the imaging of the eye uh, in order to help figure out what's going on to intervene as quickly as possible. So eye imaging, uh, I just want to uh, uh, show you a few examples. So eye imaging is probably the highest resolution imaging you could do currently in the human body. Uh, the eye is, um, you know, there's no bone. You could basically look through the pupil and do some amazing uh, pictures. So in the last century, we could do nice color photographs, and some of you might have had that uh, you know, if you were unfortunate to be dilated by your eye doctor to get these types of pictures like the ones I showed earlier. Uh, then, um, uh, about 10 years ago, we developed something called optical coherence tomography. So this is using light in a way that's kind of like ultrasound. Uh, basically sending a bright light and then reflecting it back and analyzing the pattern. And so essentially when you use this technique, you could image the eye, which is part of the brain, at, at micron resolution. So that's about 100 times or more uh, higher resolution than a brain MRI. So it, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and then since 2017, we could actually now image the blood vessels inside the eye. So this is a human uh, eye with just the blood vessels, we follow the red blood cells as they're traveling through the uh, tiny uh, blood vessels, capillaries uh, in the retina, and then we reconstitute, we regenerate the picture uh, using the flying red, red blood cells. So we can now essentially look at everything that uh, we wanted to measure in the eye. So uh, finally, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, eye movement exam could be affected by a vestibular problem. So we look at, well, how, can you hold your eyes still? Can you move your eyes the way that we want you to? Uh, does it move a certain way when we stimulate it to move? Do the eyes lined up, uh, one eye versus the other? We check for your eye alignment, and you know what does the brain imaging show? Uh, so it's a fairly thorough uh, eye exam, uh, a little bit more than the typical uh, general eye exam, but it's because we know how important the nervous system is in vision and in eye movement control and how they could be affected in acoustic neuroma. So uh, let me just uh, summarize. Uh, so this is really all you need to remember from my talk. Uh, in terms of eye evaluation for patients with acoustic neuroma, you want to be thinking, you know, are the symptoms relatively vague? Uh, how long have they been there? And our goal is to look to see if there's something going on in the front of the eye or the back of the eye. Uh, does there, is there something that could be uh, associated with acoustic neuroma and affecting the vision? Uh, we also look at the eye movement exam to see, are you able to do these basic things? Hold the eyes still, move the eyes, are the eyes moving together? Are they dancing when they shouldn't be? Things like that. 
And then uh, the last point is, um, is there presence of weakness of the face? So facial weakness causes difficulty closing the eye or decreased blink on that side, which gives you a very common but easy to treat uh, problem, which is uh, dry eye syndrome or eyelid inflammation. So um, thank you so much for um, being here today. Uh, I'd be happy to um, you know, connect uh, later on. And here's my information. Uh, I'll stay around a little bit uh, into the lunch in case any of you have questions for me. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.